We will begin with the opening prayers. Yeah, boy, 
Uh, can you all hear me? I'd like to begin by offering my greetings to all of the Sangha members of the monasteries and numbers, the lamas, the spiritual friends, and the tulkus, and in particular the uh, nuns and the shedras, and the uh, and as, as well as all the people who are listening all over the world over the internet. Today is the seventh day of our Arya Chema spring teachings. And so today, I would like to speak with you all about the 14th and the 15th of the good deeds from the autobiographical verses, Good Deeds by Mikya Dorje. Now, according to the outline from the commentary by the attendant Sanjay Paldrum, there are, there are two main parts, exchanging himself for others in meditation and uh, taking adversity as the path and both meditation. These are the past, uh, the main sections of the path on meditating on uh, bodhicitta. During the uh, passion taking adversity on the path and both meditation, there are 10 subtopics. And we've gone through the first and the second, third. And so today, what we've come to are the fourth, taking pleasing words as the path, and the fifth, taking suffering as the path. And so here are the uh, here are the here are the verse is the verse from the root text. I think this is a little bit wrong. One moment.
So I'd made a bit of a mistake when I was doing that. So this is what it is. So this is the one about uh, taking pleasing words as a path. Virtuous acts and results done with the hope of a return, like speaking nicely, hoping for sweet words, cannot be for the sake of uh, true enlightenment. How is it possible to cling to virtue and its good result as mine? I think of this as one of my good needs. Now, there's a note here when it talks about sweet words. It says, in giving up deceiving others through craft and fraud, this Lord seems to have shown us a necessary example. Uh, so some people say uh, there are differences in the spelling here in the time. It's saying, saying that it is uh, hoping, like speaking nicely, hoping for is it, uh, speaking nicely, nicely because of good words. In any case, whenever it is, in the past days, in the day, days. Uh, so these days, when we are, when we're trying to engage in a right livelihood and a right speech, so there are people who say that they're trying to engage in a right livelihood and right speech. So many people, what they say is they speak really nicely, but in actual, uh, they they live off of they use uh, they try to, their main aim is actually to use things to gain more things. That is, they uh, try to find ways to get more things from things, and to, they flatter the sponsors, and they try to use various different uh, methods. to do various different things. And when they act in this way, even though they and others have faults, they don't say that they were faults. Instead, they pretend that they are positive qualities. They explain them as positive qualities. Likewise, even if they have an opportunity to prevent someone else from doing something wrong, They have the, if they have the hope that this is going to, uh, is this, you think if there's, if there's some opportunity that you can prevent from someone doing something, if they have a fault and you can do, and it's possible for you to definitely stop them from doing it, then you should. But if these people, if they don't do that, and even if they have the opportunity to prevent someone else from doing something wrong, then they don't want to offend them. So they don't speak straightforwardly. They don't speak honestly. And they try to cover up all of the other person's faults. And for these people, what people call them is like, they say to them, oh, that spiritual friend speaks in early respect, respectful. They never uh, insult anyone. They always look up to other people and they always consider other really important. And so that's what they say. And so other people think that he's a really important, a really great person. So he's a spiritual, he doesn't say various ways, he speaks well. And so in order that their reputation for doing this, is that they consider uh, the uh, uh, pseudo-virtuous speech as being the most important thing. And that's how they lead their lives. Basically, everyone don't like it when they're criticized, right? And so for that reason, in order that they won't be criticized what they do, sometimes they praise others. And if you praise someone else, then, then in response, that person that person will praise you in return. If you praise someone else, and the other person is not going to criticize you back, right? So they think, if they think that you need to, what do they think that the best way, if we want someone else to praise you, then the best way to get that to happen is to praise the other. It's because if you praise the others, then they'll praise, praise themselves. And they think that this is going to make you good, that you're, your merit and around like that because really widely known and uh, be known all over. But as I explained the other day, the character, Mickey Dorji's character was, is that no matter who someone was, whether high or low, and a powerful person or wealthy person, uh, or people like who had no power and no wealth, you didn't dis distinguish them between that way. He said, if they didn't have any qualities, he wouldn't flatter them saying that they had 
uh, uh, qualities. And you never keep an ulterior selfish intent and thinking that, oh, if I give them a gift, then they're going to do something back to me, something good back to me. You never made such a... Uh, uh, had such sort of evil intentions and praising and others and doing things. He never did that. So in brief, he didn't have any selfish thoughts at all. Nor did he ever hold on to hopes for this lifetime and think, think that things would turn out well, hopes for things to turn out well in this lifetime. He never thought about that in any ways. And he also thought that hoping for fame or for people to praise you, saying that there is, and so he never would say that the pseudo virtuous actions you could say are the, the things that actually aren't virtuous, but if you look at them, seem like they're virtue, and seems it seems like you're practicing dharma, and so that was such. A, and he saw that that way of acting was a uh, meaningless and pointless. In general, we're talking about pseudo-virtue or, or, or doing virtue for the sake of fame in this life alone. As we don't need to mention that it's not even going to uh, become the, the path that leads to higher realms and liberation. It's not, it's not even going to lead you to the higher realms. And because the aim for it is that you're not thinking about the future and lives and later. It's thinking what's going to happen in this lifetime. And so because if you're, any, any action you do for the sake of this lifetime or with the aims for this life and cannot have a, uh, bring a benefit in the future lifetimes. And so the pseudo virtues you do in uh, this lifetime with the focus from this lifetime are not going to benefit you in the future lifetimes. And so there, um, there are no benefit in achieving liberation and omniscience. And so... Uh, Mika Dorja never thought them as to be important or as uh, significant. And so for these reasons. There are a lot of people who would come and see Mika Dorja. There are a lot of different types of people who had uh, connections with him. And among them, there are many people who kind of hoped, oh, maybe the Kamarpa will do something good for me. Maybe he'll compliment me or praise me. And if he does that, I'm, I'm going to have a slightly higher status, right? A lot of people came with him with that hope. However, but Mikudoja never acted as they wanted him to, and so they got angry. So when they got angry, they'd go out and say many things that were actually harmful to Mikudoja's uh, reputation. So this happened in many different times. But no matter how much they did this, Mikitoja never thought about this. He just never thought about it. He never gave it any thought. He never made, paid much attention to it. For what it says in the Dharma is that, for example, you've got the higher realms, right? Among the three realms, when we're doing the worldly samadhi, you can go from the lower realms to the higher to the higher realms, right? That's what it's taught in the Dharma, right? So when you're going from the, the lowest realm, this is the desire realm, right? And so if you're practicing jhana meditation and uh, shifting to the higher realms, then just before you're about to do that, then all of the Mars of the Dharam are going to try to prevent you. They're all going to get together because if you are able to uh, uh, transcend the desire realm, then you, they aren't going to be able to do anything. So they all get together and they see what they can do to, uh, to harm you. And no matter how much they try, but... But what you need to do for them is actually respond is by responding with the great samadhi of loving kindness. 
And uh, should never, you should never have, uh, you should only think of them with love, never have any malicious thought for them is what it's taught. And so if that is the way it is, if someone who's doing worldly jhana meditation should think away, then the bodhisattvas have to have an even vaster uh, 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 vision than that. And the reason is that the bodhisattvas want to achieve the state of uh, the state that dwells in either Sintar or Nirvana, the state of omniscience. If you're going to want to achieve omniscience then, the state of Buddhahood then, and you're working just and striving to bend, liberate all sentient beings from throughout about space from suffering. It's quite possible that some sentient beings are going to do things to harm you. And so when people like that, and so if you get upset and then that uh, anger, then forget about doing that. In fact, and the bodhisattvas actually have to have a special uh, compassion for them. They must have a great loving kindness for them. In other words, you need to take them in as a reason to feel more loving kindness and compassion. And so when you think about these points, there are some people in our own society who these days, they've, you know, fallen into suffering. They have, uh, they mistake what is kind of like a fake, uh, fake happiness is for being pleasure. And they really think that they've gotten some high status, and they think that they have, think that they have a lot of power. They think that they have really rich, and they think that this is really something. That is something really something to be powerful and rich. But, but merely being rich and being famous are actually actually just suffering by nature. They're not uh, pl actually pleasurable. But they think that this is happiness, and they they fo fool them are deceived into thinking that. And they try to get other people to um, uh, praise them. They try to get. They want other people to look at them well. Actually, the way these people act, if we think about it, actually, this is actually a situation where we should really feel more compassion for them. It's not something we should feel angry about. So when you think about the situation and these nature, actually, Mikio Dorje understood this, and because of this. Whenever Mikyo Dojo was speaking to other people or when he was praising other people, whatever he was saying, he would always speak uh, with uh, starting from a deep understanding. When you look at what he says to others, as, as when he looked at whatever he said to other people, he was always looking to see, would it be of benefit? He didn't just say anything, uh, anything at all. Even when he was making jokes to other people, or is just engaging in ordinary conversation. The way he spoke was really different than anyone else's. It was really amazing, actually. It's completely different than other people. It was always kind of very weighty words. As he always said really amazing things. And when he said them, people didn't think, about it. I better write this down on paper. It's like a really important point there. So the people always had the feel that feeling. It's like when you hear these points, it's like you can clearly see what the crucial points of practicing virtue and giving up misdeeds are, or whether you're talking about dharma or worldly affairs, you've got to really hit the main point. And so when it's just come out of whatever you're saying, speaking, to the generally when he was speaking, uh, there was kind of this weight in what he said, and there were real major points in what he a point to what he said. And so because of this, when we think about you know, we have the right speech, which is one of the eight branches of the Noble Path, right? The right speech. And if you think about what we should be meaning of this, I think, is what we should be measured against uh, Mikyo Dorje's speech. So that's what that is. So above, in that 14th good day, the main points, the, the, if you want to summarize the main points, there are, so when we are doing virtue in others, we should not expect for a, a response. That's what it says. And so I think there are three main points there, or three things that we need to know, three points that we need to know. And the first point is that a compliment, you should not compliment others in order to be praised or cared about or have people show their affection. You know, we shouldn't in order that other people praise us, other people care about us, or so that 
or so that people will give us like a likes on Facebook or on that, right? They give, they give you likes on Facebook and social media, right? If we uh, praise other people, we shouldn't do that. What this point comes down to is that, of course, this, this stanza was written like three or 400 years ago. That's how there is. And so if we're going to understand it well, I think we need to think about it in terms of our present day situation. And then I think we'll understand it better. The main point is what he's saying is, is that we should not praise others in order that someone else will praise us. Or we shouldn't uh, praise others in order to receive compliments. I'll to take a little bit of an example. The good actions that we do now, the virtues that we accomplish now, should not be done for the, if we do those for the sake of receiving praise or sympathy, then that's not right. The aim of doing virtue shouldn't be just solely for the sake of receiving praise from others. If we do it for the sake of receiving praise or for receiving sympathy from others, then it's not actually true virtue. Like there's a good example, I think, a good example of this. And the example is uh, for these days of what a lot of people do. And they're going, they go out. They go out and they wear really stylish clothes, really nice stylish clothes. Of course, if you're, you're monastic, so then you don't have in particular, you know, special clothes you're going to wear. You just wear your own. But generally, but generally, generally, people when they go out, they wear nice clothes, and they go and they take a picture of themselves, and then they look and see, well, what direction, you know, what angle is this way to take the picture? They said they're kind of is it better to take from the right, or yes, from above or below? They're moving their, you know, moving the camera all around. It's both left and right and all over. And then they make take the pictures, right? And after they take the picture, then they want themselves to look nice, and they want their clothes to look good, and they want to make sure so that they have a, you know long legs or that their 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 <clears throat> so that their uh, faces are don't look fat, and they hold their their camera in different ways to make it look like this, right? And then they take the picture, and then once they've taken the picture, then that's still not okay, not enough. Once they take the picture, then they put it at a photo processing software, they put it into an app, right? They drink the picture and then they kind of edit it there. Uh, they kind of, if, you're, if your skin is dark, you make it a little light. If you're looking, if you look fat, then you make your chest a little thin. So people do this, right? They do all these things. And once they've got it so that they like it and they're happy with it, this takes a few minutes to do this, right? I spend a few minutes doing this, and when they've made it so it looks like they want it, then only then do they uh, post it on the internet. They put it on the internet and said, okay, I've put out a nice picture. Are gonna people take any inches? Are they going to notice? Are they going to like it? How many likes will I get? And they stay there, say they're hoping and waiting. So many people, these who need so they actually have got completely artificial pictures. And this is the actual person you wouldn't recognize because the, per the other person in the picture and the actual person are completely different. The person, the person actually doesn't have, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look like much. And the other one's like this really, uh, you know, amazing person, right? And so if you look at the way people do this, if you talk about this really clearly, is that they're doing this in order to get praise from others. They're getting it for other people to see them nicely. That's the main point, right? I'm not saying you can't do this. But the main, the aim for doing it is so that other people will look, see you nicely, see you well. Now, there's another situation we can think about. For example, if we say, oh, I'm going to go see the Joe statue in Lhasa. Or if you haven't seen your root guru for a long time, then you're going to go see them. Or sometimes in Tibet, they're, you know, these uh, uh, older women, right? And what these older women do, and they're going to go on a pilgrimage, right? They're going to like, they're going to go see a monastery or something. 
or even if they're just going to go to some like retreat cave up in the mountains, sometimes you have to go when you're going to go on a pilgrimage, right? And if you have to go on a pilgrimage like that, then they don't hold back and they put on new clothes and they wear nice clothes and they wear them well. When they're putting on the good clothes and the nice clothes and wearing them well, the reason why they're doing that is that because in their minds, they're going to say, I'm going to see Joel Rinpoche, right? I'm going to see the Joe statue. And this is like, and they have a lot of faith in the Joe statues. They're going to visit their root guru and they haven't seen them for a long time. They're going to see them and so they, they have faith, right? And so when they're going to see them, then so in order to, they're really delighted about the situation. They're excited about this. And because of this, they're so happy about it. So they wear nice clothes. They put on new clothes, right? It's not that they're thinking about other people are going to praise them when they put on their clothes. So that's the situation, right? There's another type of a situation, right? For example, sometimes when you have parties, right, and you have a celebration of some sort, you know, like so in the outside they have all sorts of gala events. It's sort of like some sort of party. When you're having all of these, when you're having a big gala, then what happens is that people, and like, so when you're maybe, you know, someone's getting, you know, is getting married or there's some sort of an award ceremony or some other big event. And if you ha and sometimes you have to go to these, right? Now, when you have to go to such events, you have to fit into the way that you have to wear good clothes that are appropriate to the occasion. If you just wear all sorts of, if you wear, you know, any sort of shoes and any sort of hat and go there, then it's going to be kind of disrespectful for other people. It's kind of like it's inappropriate for that event, for that occasion. So in those situations, what you have to do is you have to wear good clothes. You have to wear the appropriate clothing, right? But if another that, for example, you're going to go to like an orphanage. going to go to some place where you can uh, help out the needy people. If you're going to like uh, give them food or give them gifts or generation donations or something. If at that time, you're going to go out to see poor people, right? So that time you wear the, your fanciest clothes and you, you put on all sorts of makeup and to do that, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Are, are you going to make, are you going to be generous or are you going to go take pictures that you can send to other people? That's what you, you kind of wonder that. So what I'm talking about, like taking pictures and wearing clothes, these are just illustrations. They're just illustrations. In our own lives, actually, there are many other situations like this, a whole lot of situations, and we can't go through each of them. For example, these days, there are many actors and many uh, famous singers, movie stars and singers. And they go, many of them go off to do good things, like uh, being generous to poor people and so forth. You think about it from one aspect, that's actually, it could really be because they have really kind feelings and they have a benevolent feelings. They wish to help people. But from another example, it could be so that people see they look better in society or so they have a good reputation. It's possible that they act out of that motivation too. But when you speak about it in terms of the Buddha Dharma, and to think in terms of someone who's practicing the Dharma, the, the way we should think about things is, in terms of being a Dharma practitioner, practitioners shouldn't do anything only to receive praise or a warm welcome or concern from others. So whatever it, actions we do or whatever virtues we do or whatever good actions we do for those purpose, that's not okay. Not only that, not generally like when we are talking about like studying the philosopher doing retreats, these are actually anything but they're good things. The things they should all re rejoice about. There are many things like that. However, if everyone said, if we think of the episode, Oh, they're so wonderful. I have such faith in the, he must have such great faith in the guru. Or they might say, oh, look, and he's oh, studied so many texts. He's studied so many texts and 
praise him in that way. And so he has spent so many years in retreat and I praise them in that way. And brave. If it's a while you're doing the virtue or after you've finished doing the virtuous action, if there are people who say of the, if you're doing if you've done the virtues and if you if you've done them so that other people have good feelings about, it, think it's good, take interest in it or pay attention to you. I think that there'll be more people who liked it. If you use them for that sake, then that's not good. If you accumulate a virtue in that way, it doesn't have much of a point. If you look at it as something, if, the, if it takes, some of the people take you as a good ex example, like when I was little, uh, if you see, there's a good example, and I'm sure they're probably still like this, but and there are a lot of older people. There are many older people who, who actually, they're illiterate. They don't really know how to read. They, don't, they're, they kind of pretend to read, but they're actually illiterate. And in terms of the Dharma, they really don't know much at all. They don't have any sort of broad understanding. But the way they act is, is that in their own lifetime, they spend they do whatever time they could and they wouldn't waste it. And they'd read as many money mantras as they could. So, so they did this in a way that no one else could see. They would uh, think of it for the sake of all sentient beings, and they would have recited several hundred million money mantras already. The way that they're accumulating the virtue is the actual way to accumulate money. That's how we should do it, actually. So for that reason, when we're doing virtuous things, we absolutely must. The main point that we need to think about is, we need to think of what is our motivation? We need to examine that before we even begin doing the virtuous action. We need to think, what is the reason why are the... Or what is the initial intention in doing this virtuous action? We need to really think about that carefully. Is it a good way or a bad way? If we're doing virtues, if we're doing, we should do it for the benefit of others. Or are we doing it for the sake of other people to praise us? And you need to examine that. It's really important to look at this. Otherwise, if we have a mistaken motivation and accumulate virtue, then we think I've done a whole lot of virtuous things. And other people look to say, I think, oh, well, they're doing virtue. And everyone is yourself and others have been f deceived by all of these uh, fake virtues, and that's not good. But when I'm talking about this, what some people must think, some people might think, I said, you must should never accept praise from other people. And you say, you should say that no one must, should ever, some people might think that. But if you think of that, was it, then you have to, then you haven't really understood what I'm saying here. What the Kaju forefathers have said, it is if, and what happens automatically is a city, so don't give it up or don't reject it. And so the main point is so that, is that we shouldn't do a virtuous actions for the sake of being praised or for a good result in terms of being a Dharma practitioner. But when you've done something virtuous and done something good, if something therefore then naturally praises you, at that time, you should you should you shouldn't pretend. Oh, I don't have any of the eight world dharmas and say, oh, please don't praise me. And then specifically and particularly block those praises. You should that itself becomes one of the eight worldly dharmas. If you stop the eight, uh, eight world dharmas, eight worldly dharmas, and then you try to stop that, then it actually itself becomes one of the eight worldly concerns because you're saying, oh, I'm not I don't care about the uh, eight worldly dharmas. Is that negative saying that? How does saying that I want to be praised? But there's a limit to the praise. And if you don't have a limit to this, then then your mind, then your mind will kind of just fall over whether people are praising or criticizing. And that if your mind if your mind follows uh, praise and criticism, then you're going to be going to be upset about it. Because in your left hand, sometimes you're praised, sometimes you're criticized. If you're, when you're praised, you're happy, and you're criticized, you're unhappy, then your whole life will just 
will not just be, you know, like exactly the way you want and nice. So you have to have some, you know, independence in your mind or some ability to stand on your own feet. Because if uh, just praise and blame just going to upset you, then that's not right. In particular, when we're doing the, the main aim for doing virtuous things, the If it is to for other of the for the sake of getting others to praise us, then that is not at all not at all right. That's the main point. Likewise, when we do, not only is it not right for us to uh, uh, do things uh, virtuous things for the sake of uh, seeking others, it's as what we come to the second point. It's saying that we should not do virtuous things for others uh, um, to uh, to give us uh, good things or a good reputation. But Mikatoji says that we should not uh, do virtue in the sake of other people to praise us. Not only should we should not hope for any good response or for anything receiving any good results for the virtue. So if we're hoping to get a good result from the virtue ourselves, and then we do the virtue, then that is not good. So generally when we're doing virtuous things, so, so the virtue, the main point about the, of this is, that normally when we do the virtue, we do the virtue, it's not okay to do it for, to receive a virtue, a good result ourselves. When you do something good, uh, when you do something good with hope that you'll get something good in return, then that's not the right end of no. So then why is it that we do virtues? What is the reason why we need to virtue? We need to uh, do virtuous acts in order to gather the accumulations, right? So if, we need, so if you need, we need to do virtuous things in order to uh, gather the accumulations, but however, when we're actually doing the virtue, we need to understand how to do the virtuous act. When we're actually doing the virtues, if we have a lot of attachment to a good result and have a, and have this big expectation for a good return, then we sh uh, then we if we do that, then we won't be able to really do the uh, the virtue. For example, for example, if you have if you have some money, like a ten thousand rupees or ten thousand dollars, and you're going to give this to someone else, and so if I give this, then in the future then I'm just going to have like incredible copious amounts of money. And so you give that and you close your eyes and give the $10,000 to the other person. Is that the right way to do virtue? It's difficult to say that it's the right way to do it. I do you think that are going to give some big gift and because of getting a gift and what you think, oh, I really made a huge gift. And because of that, then one day, Maybe I'll become really rich. They have this big help. They have the big hope for this. And they have this attachment. And if you stay like that, is that the right way to practice virtue? Or is that a good way to practice virtue? It's difficult to say it is. Generally. So how does it all of these difficulties come? Now, these days, many people are really interested in external things. We're always only looking outside. We're looking only outside when you see the external, there's been such great development in external things and they're so bright and enticing that we're fooled by them. And so when you say practice virtue, then actually that's a quality of the internal mind, right? But because we have such strong imprints of the, the habitual imprints of the external things that we, uh, the danger that we'll see virtue as being something that's like an external thing. So hoping for something in return is to think that something is going to come from outside. A good thing is going to come to me from outside. It's like, so when people do virtuous action with that hope, it's like we see that we have that big hope that something's going to, something is going to come from outside. Like for example, if you have like an apple tree, right? And apple fruits, right? So you have the apple, the tree, the apple tree, you plant, you plant the apple tree so that you can grow apples and you work so you can grow apples. Then one day the apple tree 
you've planted the apple tree. Then after you plant it, then you're gonna you're gonna go look at it. And when is the fruit gonna ripen? If you go out there every day, you look at it. You think when is the fruit gonna ripen? You get really attached to that. And then one day, when the tre uh, tree gets a little bit bigger and the apples grow and they ripen, then you think, I think I'm going to eat this. When am I going to get to eat an apple? If you're only sitting there waiting for that, you're going there looking, and you're sitting there looking at it every day. What's going to happen? It's similar. The way we accumulate virtue is kind of like exactly like that. Actually, when we talk about accumulating virtue, what do we mean is, Accumulating virtue means, to give an example, you, you like apple trees. You, you like the apple tree itself. And so you, you plant the apple tree for that. Reason. It's not because you uh, plant the apple tree out of the wish to eat the apple. It's not that way of, that's not how you should think. And so you take that apple tree, if you plant it in your own yard, so that only you can eat it, and so no, you don't, that's not, it's not, if you're going to practice virtue, that's not the type of plan you should make. Instead, we should, if you're going to practice virtue, not in your own yard, but you put it in like some sort of a public space, like a public park or public garden, you plant the gar the apple tree there. Then one day, then that, when the fruit ripens on that apple tree, when that tr fruit ripens, then you can eat it. And also, and every announcer who comes to that uh, park can eat it. Everyone can enjoy the fruit, and everyone can, and if everyone finds it ha happy and they're happy, then you're also kind of a joyous and happy or satisfied with it too, right? And so for this way, the way we practice the Dhammanisu should be like this. Now, this uh, apple tree is just an example. When you say hey, practice virtue, When you think, oh, when you practice virtue, they're going to result in it's not going to happen right away. And so when the fruit doesn't ripen immediately, we think, oh, karma doesn't come to us. I didn't do that. Is this problem? Did I do it? And if you do something and you think, I'm going to have a great result, you think, oh, man, I haven't got the result yet. It's like that, that's the karma cause and it can't be, it can't be true. It's possible you might think like that. Actually, if you believe in karma cause and it's you have to believe that someday, earlier or later, that fruit is going to ripen, right? Otherwise, if it's like, it's not, it's going to, it's not like the apple tree. It's like if you're sitting there really attached and you go look at the apple tree every day. If you think about it, the ordinary people think I said, if I do good things for them now, then one day they're going to do something. There's no choice but to do something good for me in return. And so we're sitting there waiting, when are they going to do something good? We're always sitting there, always thinking like that. That way of uh, doing things isn't accumulating virtue. So, so that's the 14th of the good deeds. That's the summary of its meaning. And so, so I think we'll take a break now and we'll have a 30 minute um, intermission and then we'll reconvene.
Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Next, I would like to speak about the 15th of the good deeds. And this 15th good deed is, in terms of the outline, is the fifth of the 10 things to take as the path, uh, taking suffering as the path. And the verse reads, unreasonable, intolerable, unbearable though they were, the more I experienced the results of karma, the more I gained, became convinced that what the Buddha taught is true. I gained conviction in the importance of taking adversity as the path. I think of this as one of my good deeds. Now, the meaning of this is as I've uh, explained over the past several days, there are many unfounded accusations against Mikya Dorje. And people who uh, responded uh, inappropriately to his good acts. And then there are people whom he had trusted or relied on who uh, deceived him in, uh, in reply. In many such situations, likewise, there are times when he uh, had physical illnesses or encountered obst uh, obst obstacles to his activity. But no matter what uh, adversity he faced, what other bad circumstances he faced, the way he thought was. So he, so he thought, 
Oh, I am the Tulka, I am the reincarnation of the Karmapa. I'll never turn away from the three jewels. I'm not going... And my intention is only to benefit others. So everything I do is uh, in accord with the Dharma. So, so when there's bad karma, it's impossible for such adversity or bad karma. Why is it? What is the reason why it would happen? It's like you get uh, upset or to get depressed about it. That never happened at all. And you could never say anything like that. What he would say actually was, from the samsara with that beginning, we have harmed many sentient beings. We've harmed them in many ways and given them, uh, caused them various sufferings. And so they'd think, this is the karmic ripening of that. But the way that it is the result of the connection between the cause and I can't know that in its entirety right now. But even though I can't know that in its entirety, if I look at the words of the Bhagavan Buddha, and so they said, this is how uh, karmic cause and effect works, I think, oh, this is how it is. I have the certainty in this. And so as someone who believes the words of the Buddha and who considers them and respects them, and so we have to believe that these are the results of karma. If you don't respect the words of the Buddha, then you say, oh, he's a, uh, he knows something, but he doesn't know what's going on for me. In particular, if you're someone who's really born in a good dharma, with a good dharma being, if you're someone who's born who's in mixed your mind and dharma, who are really able to practice, whether it's an illness or suffering or adversity or whatever happens, all of this for that sort of person is not adversity. For that person, there are excellent circumstances that bring us to do good actions. Because of the adversity, then There's a great benefit in practicing the Dharma and feeling and uh, feeling renunciation and so forth. So for him, it was a very great uh, benefit. There are many ex uh, illustrations or examples of this. For example, in Tibet, the, the greatest of all the Mahasiddhas was Milarepa. And Milarepa, when he was little, uh, did sorcery and and killed people. And he, 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 got, he accumulated great misdeeds. I mean, it is, once he had accumulated all those misdeeds, if there's really nothing that he could do to rectify to make it good. But because of his courage, because of the way he thought, it was different than other people's. And so he thought that the, the misdeeds that he had done and the bad karma he had done became like a favorable condition for um, benefiting someone, but helped him develop uh, uh, courage and gave him the ability to endure um, innumerable uh, uh, innumerable hardships. And this all happened because of the misdeeds that he had accumulated. Likewise, when you think about uh, Gampopa, when Gampopa was little, uh, he got married. When he was younger, he got married, he, uh, and he had a son and a daughter, and he was in a household, living in a household, and at that time, and then there was an epidemic, and his uh, children died, and his uh, wife also died. And because of this, uh, at this difficulty, then he felt uh, the wish for liberation from samsara, entered the gate of dharma, and in the end became the founder of the, uh, the, founder of the Dapokaju lineages. Or if we think about uh, the glorious Jusim Kempo, when he was little, around the time when he was 15, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a girl whom he loved. And she left him. And she, they said, anyway, she went off with someone else, right? She went off with someone else. Then what? 
And he got very angry. And he uh, cast a spell that actually killed that person. Because of that, then he developed their wish for liberation and entered the gate of Dharma and practiced the Dharma, right? And so if we look at it, the difference between great beings and ourselves is that when we experience the adversity, so no difference in whether you experience suffering or experience adversity. That, uh, the difference is that for great individuals, they're able to turn the adversity into a good situation. They have the courage and the wisdom to do that. And so for that reason, when we have this, they, uh, it becomes a great loss for us. We don't have the any way to take the, the adversity and if we're able to use it, and we aren't able to make it into something that will bring benefit to us. So, in particular, in the old days, or whether it's these days, what many people think is that they think, oh, I'm a Dharma practitioner. When you say I'm a Dharma practitioner, and they give that, and they give that name, But has that person actually developed belief in karma cause and effect? Probably not. Forget about the uh, subtle aspects of, uh, of what should be done and what should not be done. They don't even refrain, refrain from the course actions that they should refrain from. Then in addition, what do they say is they, oh, I'm someone who guards, uh, guards, uh, guards discipline in my eyes. And I'm someone who uh, practices what should be done and what should be given up very uh, finely. And they fool themselves, they deceive others. And then they say to this, oh, I have uh, purified all the results of bad karma. And they, they say this, uh, they over-exaggerate things. And when they exaggerate things like this, and someone says something slightly under, some, some, some slightly bad about them, or if there is some sort of suffering that happens in his body, some sort of illness, Or if there's someone who uh, he trusts who then deceives them. Or if the normal, they have a lot of uh, uh, wealth and, and things. If they all go bad and get lost or sort of stolen, some other misfortune occurs. Or when they get themselves in some different situation, they get find that they have nothing they can do and they have to leave the place and they have to leave all of their belongings and their wealth and so forth and their friends and family. If they have, when that happens, in the past, the, the prior to that, that they had said, I'm a Dharma practitioner, what they say is, I'm really a Dharma practitioner, and because of that, and so people say really terrible things about me. And and uh, so I, they're, they're staining my good name as a Dharma practitioner and thinking I better leave. And so there are people who speak like this. So in brief, the main point is that these people uh, feel worried that they're going to lose status in this lifetime. They think that their their wealth and their power and their uh, uh, renown, uh, reputation in this life are going. They're going to lose those, and so they have that sort of a fear that this is going to happen. They have that uh, sort of attachment or aversion over this. Likewise. And they have such great uh, attachment to the good things of this life that they worry about them. They're so attached to them that they worry very hard. And if you need a comparison to them, Mikidorji's way of thinking was completely different. The way Mikidorji thought about things was, it was when you think about the, Talk about sentient beings. When you think about the situation, we can say that they're weak and sentient beings. The reason we call that is because they're under the control of, uh, of the karma and afflictions. And so, they have, and so in terms of their power, they're actually very weak. And so what these weak sentient beings, what they do is they're always harming each other in various ways in order to bring themselves happiness in the bo and mind and body. What they do is they spend all their time uh, harming each other. And if you look at the way they do, if you take an example, what it's like is if you've got a cancer patient, someone who has like the uh, 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 
a chronic case or a, a, a case of cancer where they have the, the, the doctors say this is stage four cancer, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do, we cannot have me medicine to give you, then what's going to happen? They're going to suffer, right? That sentient being, from the very beginning, if they're, they if they're, some of them, they're from the very beginning, they're experiencing the various different suffer, uh, suffering, the different differences, and then more that are addition to them. And so that person, and the, the, they're actually the same as people who are given up on, the, the, uh, the cancer patient the doctors gave up on. And so Mika Dorothy would look at these weak and sentient beings and have even more unbearable uh, compassion for them. But when he said that Mika Dorothy felt uh, unbearable compassion, well, what are the signs of this unbearable compassion? What are the reasons for it? Later, Mika Dorothy himself, he only didn't, he only lived 48 years, right? So these days are very young uh, for these days. Likewise, Mika Dorji later uh, had many illnesses. Now, I can't really say exactly what uh, illnesses he had, but he did have many uh, illnesses. And many of them were very um, uh, painful illnesses. And so if we don't use, uh, so he, had a very, he experienced a lot of suffering if we don't use honor for terms. And the way he thought about them was, all of the suffering that I've experienced is because of the, it's the ripening of the harm that I've caused many others in samsara without beginning. And when he's thinking in this way, and no matter how much suffering experienced with his body, <laughs> he'd become that much more careful about even the smallest karmic causes and effects and about he had to become even more careful and uh, about uh, his actions of karma, cause and effect. And so for this reason, if we look at the way, uh, his way of acting then, what happens for people who, are, who have the right capacity, the good uh, result, what the, the the imprint that this shows is that they have this, and when this sort of suffering occurs to us, the, it's something that's going to, uh, so when you've done something with this karma, it's going to definitely give a result of suf suffering. But what if you look at what, you need to look at what is the basis for the re, uh, the suffering, for the suffering, isn't it? And so if you want to overcome the suffering, you have to come up with the best way, you look at the antidote for the causes of suffering, and you need to look at what's the best things. And so we can see this in the life of Mikhail Dorje. Now, those who don't have that compiled question, this look at this, if such suffering could occur to such a great being as Mikhail Dorje, because of like all of these physical problems you've had and all the bad karma, it's impossible that could have happened. And if you have such a hard time, a hard, difficult time physically, then, then we need to do the various services that are taught in the sutras when we say, or we have the uh, rituals to repulse rep So we need to do, we need to do services. We need to uh, engage in the uh, services to stop, the, to repel, uh, to prevent the bad circumstances. Actually, make it to himself. It's not possible that that could happen. But if it did happen, then forget what he would say. The people said that it wasn't happen, but if it does happen, then we uh, have to do services for him. But they had really didn't understand exactly what the way Mikhail Dorje thought was and how he normally acted. And the reason for this is the activity of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas is primarily it primarily depends upon the students. And what this comes down to, so do people have different levels of obscuration, right? There are different levels of obscuration, there are different levels of obscuration, different levels of misdeeds. And so because there are different de uh, degrees of obscuration and misdeeds, and therefore, when different people see the activities of the guru, some people see it as good, and some people see it as not being so good. People see it in different ways. 
And this is because of your own karmic obscurations. No, it because it depends upon your karmic obscurations, your, your attachment, your karmic obscurations. To give an example for this, when we talk about the we talk about the eight great Shravaka disciples of the Buddha, for example. During the time of the Buddha, the the, the most well known students and the most well known disciples who were with him. Uh, there were eight of them. And see, those are called the eight great Shravakas. And the most well-known of the two were Shariputra and Madhagalyayana. So everyone knows, I was right. The main ones are Shariputra and Madhagalyayana. And Shariputra was the greatest in terms of prajna. Among all of the different students, the one who had the greatest prajna was, prajna, uh, was Shariputra. The one with the greatest miracles, the one who was able to give the... <clears throat> there are many who could display miracles, but among all of them, the one who was the most powerful or the strongest was Madhagalyayana. And so when you say this, Madhagalyayana, uh, who was, had the greatest miracles, how did he die in the end? There are some Jain, non-Buddhist Jains, uh, some Jain students, and I think they were, and some of them, Uh, beat uh, beat Magdalena with sticks and killed him. They killed him until he was dead. And so Magdalena was the greatest in, in uh, miracles. And in the end, what happened is he was beat to death by someone. And so how we Buddhists explain this is that you have to be able to give an explanation, right? Because of the greatest in our miracles and at that time, and he couldn't uh, display any miracles at them. So what's going on? So why didn't he show it as a miracle at that point? The ex explanation we give is that it's because, it's because in the past he had accumulated the karma of being beaten by others. And so this is karma that must be de uh, definitely experienced. There are different types of karma. There are some that are, must be definitely experienced. Where the, uh, where the result of the karma is definitely going to ripen. There's some where it's not certain whether the result will uh, ripen or not. So there's different types of karma. And the karma that you just said is one that was a definite, one that would definitely experience. And so no one could stop it. Even the Buddha could not stop it. And so for that reason, at that time when he's being beaten by the people, he for completely forgot about the miraculous powers. And before you do a miracle, you have to do samadhi meditation, right? So you forgot to do the to show the miracle. Forget about even performing a miracle. You couldn't even think about doing it. And so in that time, they bent him, they beat him to death. So that's the way we explain it. So in brief. Even someone like the Shravaka Madhulayana could not even stop the power of the ripening of karma. For example, also with our Buddha, there are many things that happened. He had like headaches or he got uh, thorns uh, in his uh, foot and so forth. And so when we look at the examples of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the, the liberation stories of great beings, we see that there are the different levels of different degrees of, sentient beings have different degree of observation, so they see the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in different ways. If, another way of thinking about it, at the time the Buddha, Buddha appeared in, in India, there are people who saw him different. Some people saw him as good, some people saw him as bad. Uh, the Buddhas didn't see the, uh, the non-Buddhists didn't see the Buddhas being good. If even the Buddha was not seen as being a good person by everyone, if we said that everyone had to say, uh, say everyone has to see us well, then that's a kind of a asking too much. And so everyone has their own karmic obscuration, their own imprints, right? They're different comments. Some have very thick uh, imprints and some have very thin imprints. And so the way people see things are different. So next, I think I'd, I thought I'd like to give a kind of brief summary of the meaning of this 15th good deed. And so I think if I looked at it, I think there are five different points. 
if you divide it into points, there are five different points. And the first one is that, and please wait a moment. Sometimes the uh, te technological things don't do exactly what you want them to do. So here we are. So there are five main points here. And the first one is that adversity and suffering are the results of bad karma accumulated from beginningless samsara. So we must believe in karma cause and effect. That's the first point. And so the main, main meaning of this is that, as we all know, the, the essence of Buddhism is karmic cause and effect, as we all know. And we always are always talking about karmic cause and effect. And so so if you ask, well, why do we experience adversity and suffering in this life? The adversity and sufferings are the results of the bad actions we have accumulated in the past. Not only the adversity and the sufferings, but even the pleasures and the happiness and the reputation, the suffering, the problems, and all of this are the results of our karma. So how is it the karmic results occur? The karmic results, how they come? They're like the effect or the result of the actions that we have done in the past. The effect or the result of the actions in the past, or they're, they're either the effect or the result of these actions. And then the second point is that the suffering has been suffering from the outset, and there's no fairness. Um, it is it's been like this not only in this lifetime, but in all lifetimes. And the main point of this is that our lifestyle from the very beginning has been suffering. It's not like that it's just all of a sudden it's become. It's like, well, it's no fairness in life. It's not just this lifetime, it's in all lifetimes. It's the same situation in all lifetimes. And so for that reason, what we normally think is, oh, Oh, what's the reason why I have to suffer like this? Why is it people scorn me so much? I just don't understand. There's no reason for me to scorn it, but I am. So my lover left me. The person I love me left me. Why is that? We wonder. Likewise, there, when there are relatives, I think, isn't it? There's no need for them to die, but they did die. And so if we have some sort of a bad illness, we, how did I get such a horrible illness? Why did it happen to me and not to someone else? That's what we think, right? Likewise, when you think, well, why did I lose my job? Why am I having so many difficulties in my life with my livelihood? So we have many th different thoughts that come And we have all these different things. So what we think is that we think that life is not fair. It's not right. Some people become rich and some people become beggars. There's no fairness. 
I've only done good things my entire life. And I'm someone I don't really have nothing to be ashamed of. But all of these pains and problems are happening to me. Why is that? So we ask that, right? Likewise, some people don't do anything themselves, and they um, and they get and and they get it. And so, and we work hard, and we don't get any results. We don't get real riches. So we wonder why is that? So in brief, we think that life is not right. Life is not fair. And so it always seems like we're harming ourselves. This is what we think, right? And when you think about this, from one angle, this is a sign of just basically not understanding the nature of samsara and not believing in karmic cause and effect or not really having a deep belief in the uh, karmic cause and effect. And so before we ask that first question, the main question that we have is, well, how, where does suffering and unhappiness come from? We have to ask it. That's the question. That's the first question. That's the main question. As I said before, the sufferings and unhappiness we experience are the results of the bad karma we've accumulated in the past. So when we say past, so well, how long are we talking about? We're saying past. So when you past, how far back is that? Is past? It could be yesterday. It could be a previous lifetime. And it could be anything else. Anything before that could be a previous lifetime. It could be the past. So in brief, when you're thinking about most of the karma we've experienced, when we've accumulated them, has been our, in our previous lifetimes. This lifetime has been very short so far, and the previous lifetimes are incredibly long. If you think about the previous lifetimes, you can't even figure out when the first, when the beginning was. If you say it's, you can't even say that this was the first lifetime. I was there in so many lifetimes. So that's how we've had these this many lifetimes. And we've had such an in, incountable number of previous lifetimes that naturally then the, the karma we've accumulated in those uh, accumulated lifetimes also has to be uncountable. Can you hear this noise from outside? Okay. So we've had innumerably many previous lifetimes. So naturally, the karma that we've uh, accumulated in those previous lifetimes also cannot be counted. I feel like to think that this life is not fair. We think it's not right, right? And we think about it in that way. What we should remember is that there have been so many previous lifetimes. And if we think about if we think about the situations of those lifetimes or the events of those lifetimes, actually it's quite possible that we might think that there, there's nothing more fair than this. There's nothing more right than this. It's possible that we might have that thought. So that's what we mean by karma cause and effect. If you look at something just immediately or on the surface from the this lifetime, then the and when things, good things happen to other people, when the suffering all happens, we think that we said, oh, karmic cause and effect can't be true, is what we think. But, but if we think about our many previous lifetimes, and we think, and then as a, we might think that it's impossible that there would be anything that could be more true than karmic cause and effect. Now that we come to the third point. Now the third point is that uh, suffering and obstacles, even for beings such as the Buddha and the Karmapa. And so the meaning here is that 
When you talk about karma cause and effect, what is the limits of the fairness and the rightness of karma cause and effect? The various incarnations of the karmapa and even the Bhagavan Buddha also experienced suffering. The the uh, the foundation vehicle says that the 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 Buddha's body was uh, the suffering the suffering was a uh, su aggregate of suffering, but the foundation the Theravada and the foundation will say that the uh, that it, that the Buddha's body was the truth of suffering. So if it's the truth of suffering, they can also experience suffering. And so we know that the Buddha to have a difficulty in suffering, and the obstacles in suffering. So these beings can experience these. As I mentioned before, the Buddha had headaches. He, he got thorns in his feet. And his own uh, uh, half-brother, Devadatta, caused many difficulties for him. Gave him a lot of problems. And with the various karmapas, the way I see it, The amount of hard adversity and hardship that the karmapas faced, and so I think such that most people have probably never experienced anything like that. Before we even think about all the various karmapas for myself, many people have not experienced the amount of suffering and uh, adversity that I have. Now, I don't need to speak much about that. In any case, with the various karmapas, they are called in the middle of pol political and environmental and sectarian situations. They're always caught in the middle of innumerable conflicts and obstacles and pressures. And so they're caught in the middle of all that. And so people just can't comprehend it. And even if you tell it, they wouldn't believe it. But even under such difficulties and such pressure, what they were able to do is they were able to continue. Were they were they unable to keep moving, taking steps, moving forward, or did they have to give up on some other activities? Did they have to stop doing something? They did not. They didn't stop. I think the reason why they could keep uh, moving forward was that the one thing they had courage and proud that it was unlike anyone else's, and so they were able to keep moving forward. From another perspective, or an, the way they considered this life was that they said that they saw that this life is they did not see this life as being something that should be fair or right. They saw this. They, said, they did not see this life as being unfair and unright. They never even began, began to doubt karmic cause and effect. And so, now the, and so the experiences and suffering, difficulties that they experience now were the result of the bad karma that they'd accumulated in the past. And so that's the way they thought about it. And so within that understanding, then they were able to continue to move forward. And they were able to uh, uh, put up with greater difficulty and suffering than others because of this. And the reason, the main influence that allowed them to do this was that they had such deep understanding of karma, cause, and effect. They were certain that it was fair and right and true. So they had that much courage, and for that reason, no matter how bad an event was, no matter how hard the adversity was, they're able from the deep within, they're able to accept it and to bear with it. They never said, oh, I can't get it, then I give up. And nor did they ever even waver the slightest in their loving wishes for others and their faith and belief in the three jewels. This just didn't happen. And so for that reason, when we take a look at them, when we think about that, when we think of what is the difference between us and the previous karma buzz, 
is not whether they experience adversity or whether things go well or not, or experience or whether experience makes, uh, misfortunes. The difference is how we view adversity in situations and how they do. So the, the, the main difference is when adversity and difficulties happen, it's the way you view that. In this way, there's a huge distinction between ordinary beings and the karma. It's the way they would say. When they experience adversity and suffering, the way they said it is they said, they would never say that this adversity was caused by someone else. They would never blame someone else. They'd never accuse anyone else. Nor would they hold grudges against other people. And not only did they not uh, uh, do this, that the people who give them problems and even people who threaten their lives They'd say they don't really understand what kind of bad karma they're committing. They just don't really understand how terrifying a result awaits them in the future. They're uh, shrouded in ignorance. They're controlled by their karma and afflictions. And so they had even more uh, uh, compassion and love for them, they had a greater love, love for them. And so for this reason, the way they think if you, as it was like that, and so therefore, when people would harm the karmapas or, or blame them and forget about them even resenting it, they didn't even get annoyed. And not only did they not get annoyed, the adversities created by other people then became like a cause for them feeling greater love for the other person and for increasing their bodhicitta. And the reason they, that it became the cause of it is because they believed in karmic cause and effect is uh, because of the power of that. Now, among the different uh, incarnations of the karmapa, they had various different characters. Some were uh, somewhat wrathful, they're kind of a uh, short tempers. And when we look at it from the outside, we say them exactly because of uh, strict or kind of a untamed characters, but in actuality, what it was is it's like a loving mother who has a bit of a temper. So, kind of a loving mother with a bit of a, temp a temper. And these mothers with bad tempers, when they have, they worry that their children go off and go down some mess and they can do something bad. And they worry about them more than anyone else, and so then they get angry and they, they scold them. And so, and this is just the external appearance. And you say that there's a the, even this karmapas who uh, were a little bit short-tempered or some wrathful. So they're all like that. When we talk about all the bodhisattvas like uh, subhuti and so forth, we call them in Manjushri, We call them youthful. Why do we call them youthful? It's because the Bodhisattvas must have pure, clean, and childlike characters. They have pure and clean characters like children, so we call them youthful. And we adults, once we've got old, then we think about anything at all and we become really complicated. Children don't know how to have such complicated thoughts, like they're kind of an uh, uncontrived and pure and clean way of thinking. So that's the reason why bodhisattvas are called youthful. So many of the previous comments that did have even the uh, even the ones who uh, had kind of appeared to be rather angry were actually did very peaceful. Kind of, uh, were actually like the children on the inside, and some karmapas also had very peaceful characters. No need to explain that another way. It's just general gentle natures, like loving mothers. And no matter uh, just what loving and gentle mothers do is. Then no matter how many mistakes the children make, they just love them even more, and they feel even greater pains of love for them. And they really wonder, more, even more, what can I do to help my child? And so whether their, their appearance was wrathful or whether it was peaceful, it's just a difference in means. In actuality, the aims are the same. So no matter who we are, there's probably none of us who hasn't encountered sufferings and difficulties. So they might be external uh, contests or uh, difficulties from inside or physical suffering, but we've probably experienced any one of these sufferings. 
There's probably none of us who has not experienced difficulties. And some people from the outside, it seems like in their entire lives, they haven't really experienced many difficulties at all. And everything seems to go well for them. And some people, no matter what they do, it just doesn't work out. We see this, right? And when we see people like this, if you don't believe in karma, cause and effect, if you don't have a stable belief in that, you will see that this life is unfair. Why is it that some people are rich and some people are poor? Well, some people uh, work out so hard and they don't get any results. And people don't do anything at all and they have good results. Why is that? So now we don't remember previous lives. We don't remember our previous lives. And we can't see the situations of previous lives with our eyes. But if we believe that everything we experience in this life is like the effect or the result of the previous lifetimes, if we believe that, then I think it's so possible we have a, a great uh, benefit from this in the very least. We might recognize that it's not so that life is unfair or not right. We need to think really, in, if we think in detail, From one aspect, we think, of believing in karma, cause, and effect, we don't have 100% belief. Most people don't have that. But to have no belief in karma, cause, and effect at all, that's difficult. It's hard to say that. And the reason for that is, if we don't have any belief in karma, cause, and effect, then what reason is why we do anything that we do now? Why would we work hard at anything now? What's the reason why farmers plant fields? Why do they work hard to, to plant fields? It's thinking that in the autumn, they're going to have a good crop. So they believe that if they do work hard, they're going to get a result. And so they do the, the, they do the hard work. If they didn't believe that a result was going to come from it, then they wouldn't do the work. And so we think that the efforts that we do are going to have a positive result and that it's going to, that there is some sort of karma cause and effect. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. If we decide that there is a thing that there's no karma cause and effect at all, we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't work hard at all. So actually, we all in our minds already have a certain degree of belief in karma cause and effect. However, one difficulty we have when we talk about karma cause and effect. It's not like talking about a day, yesterday and today. When we're talking about past and future lifetimes, it's such a long time. You're extreme, when you're stretching out the time frame, then that gives us a difficulty. Because on the one hand, we don't see the previous lifetimes. We don't see the uh, the karma that we've ex experienced. We have we don't remember it. And there's such a long time. We get a little bit a little bit lazy. Oh, past life is so long ago. There's no point in this. But another another point is. And so for these reasons, as I said, this gives us a bit of a difficulty. And so for this reason, we have a certain degree of uh, belief in karma cause and effect, but, but we aren't able to develop uh, belief in it as it's described in the, in the, uh, in the Dharma. Now, another thing we need to think about is when touching the presentation of the Four Noble Truths, we talk about the, the truth of suffering, we talk about the different type of the presentation of suffering. So when you talk about the suffering and the origin of suffering and so forth, they talk about suffering that says, in, sarma, in samsara, there is only suffering and not even an instant of, uh, of pleasure. Now, the Buddha, Buddhist uh, texts uh, talk about many different types of suffering, coarse and subtle. Uh, and we don't need to talk about all those different types now, but in any case, in our lives, the sufferings you've experienced, the eight types of suffering, all of these suffering are occur simply because we are in samsara, simply because we've been born in samsara, they're definitely going to happen to us. And no matter how much you try to avoid them, there's no way we can stop them. So for this reason, that is why we practice the Dharma. That is why we try to achieve liberation, isn't it? If there were no suffering and samsara and there were happiness, why would we practice dharma? Why would we try to seek out liberation? There'd be no point. 
So we need to recognize that our human and su life and suffering are suffering by the or suffering from the very beginning. It's not unlike only when you experience pain and adversity that they become suffering. So that's the fourth point. The, the next to the first, fourth point. The note is that uh, whatever good situation, whatever we have bad or good situations, it all depends on the mind. So talk about it to wrap it up. All the we have difficulties and sufferings and adversities in our lives. Many different things happen. But when these events occur, the main point is that there's a big difference. A big difference in them comes about from how we look at the difficulties, how we situations. This means that whether something is a hardship or a suffering mainly depends on how we think about it. To give an example, you have a table and you've got a cup. You've got a cup on the table. And in that cup, there's only a half cup of tea. Instead of a half, full cup of tea, you've only got a half cup. So an optimist is going to look at this and say, they're going to say, oh, I've still got a half cup of tea left. And someone who's a pessimist is going to think, there's only a half cup, I've only got a half cup left, what am I going to do? There's only a half cup left, what am I going to do? It's the same. When adversity and obstacles are arise, then the pessimist is going to think, the one who doesn't think well think, is going to think, Nothing works for me. Everyone blames me. Even I'm like the different talking about these days. I'm the one who got the COVID. No one else got it. No one else know got it. And I'm the one who got the COVID. So a lot of people who think this, right? Now the optimist is going to say, you know, the optimist is going to think, oh, when the adversity occurs, and all of this is the result of their karma, karma from previous lives. Is this uh, this adversity is like it's like taking a test in this lifetime. It's like my it's like an, it's giving me a real training and education in my lifetime. And it's like an opportunity for me to purify my karma from the past. I've got such a great opportunity. In particular, there are many situations, if we only think about this lifetime, some situations become really huge, they're really important. But when you think about them in comparison to many lifetimes, some of the situations of this time, they, know they can't even consider them a, a, an event, you can't, a situation, you can't even call them business, they're so tiny. And so when you think of it as a human lifetime, it's like just depends on the way different things appear to our minds. So the root of everything comes down to the mind. And so whether a situation is good or bad primarily depends on the way you think and the way you view it. And so for that reason, you have to take care of your own mind. You have to get control of your mind. You have to take interest, pay attention to how you think about things. And now we're in the fifth point. And the fifth point is when adversity occurs, we can it's an opportunity for us to accumulate vast uh, merit. When adversity or difficulty happens, or when you're in, a, or when you're in the worst part, the hardest part of your life, when you get to that point in your lifetime, and what we need to understand is that at that point, It's like you're in a, on low ground, or if you're like in like the, the bottom of the, so you're in a very low place, right? On a very low, the bottom, you're like in the bottom of a valley, but you have a great opportunity to get to gather the accumulation of merit. And the reason for that is that the merit is like water. And so the water, uh, water uh, flows downhill. It doesn't flow uphill, right? It only falls up. It doesn't, it, come, it flows downhill, not uphill. And so when it comes down to the, it's, it's going to come flowing down. And so when you're experiencing the experience, the adversity in that worst part, then at that point, at that point, you have the 
best uh, opportunity to gather the accumulation of merit. Now, the manner in which we need to gather the accumulation, there are different things, different ways that we need to think about it. And the first thing we need to think is that so when the adversity happened, we need to recognize that it is the best opportunity to gather the accumulation of purify obscurations and make sure not to miss that opportunity and do whatever we can to gather accumulations and purify obscurations. The second thing is that if someone does need to harm us, if they do something bad to us, then what we need to think is that that we should that we must not have a malicious thought. Instead, we have to have a benevolent motivation. Then this will like multiply our uh, uh, merit exponentially compared to before. Like for example, if we want to do something, if we have a small, if you're able to get a huge profit out of just a small uh, amount of money, then you do it. Everyone would do it, right? The reason for this, if you're going to do something, if you do treat other people, then people don't do well for you. And if you don't treat people, then they're not going to be easy for them to do things to do. So if you want people to do things, even if we need to do good things, I'm not saying that you have to praise them or give them gifts. It's a question of how you think about it. It's not to think about them maliciously, but if you think about them benevolently, then that itself will uh, multiply your uh, merit exponentially, and it'll increase exponentially. Now, the third thing we need to do is that when we have adversity, then that is an incredible opportunity to train our minds as the Kadamba Gretchen said. It says adversity is a spiritual friend. And then an authentic and the spiritual friend or lama means someone who can change your mind, who can fix your mind, who can improve your mind. That's how we understand them. If, so someone who can improve your mind. So for example, if you want to train for your mind, the best um, uh, training is, is actually experience uh, in battle before. That's the best training. If you always pretend that you've done that, you we know, pretend we're going, but it's not action. But if you compare it with actually fighting in battle, that's completely different. If you're someone who's actually had real um, battle experience, your experience, that it's a completely different experience. So if it's going to be if we're having, and having good times, then everyone can look like they are a good Dharma practitioner, right? And say, oh, money, payment, compassion, everyone's the same. And everyone knows what to do, right? Actually, when you're encountering the uh, hardships, that's when you really know whether you believe in the karma cause and effect. That's when you know whether you actually have faith in the three jewels and the gurus. And so at that point, that when you're experiencing adversity, we need to be able to do practice. If we're unable to practice when we're experiencing difficulty, then forget it. Then it's not need to do it. There's no point to doing the practice that we've done in the good times. So the main point that we need to remember at some point, we're going to be lying in our deathbed. That time is going to come. There's going to be a time when we're going to have hard, we're going to, our breath is going to wheeze. And at that point, we need someone to hope for. Other than play, entrusting ourselves to the three jewels and the gurus, we have nothing else we can do because we're all going to die. Not the day we're going to die. There's no one else we can hope, uh, place our hopes in. Other than asking for protection from the three jewels and the gurus and hoping for them, there's no one else that we can who can help us. And if that time, if we have the of pure faith and belief, and it's unbearable and unstoppable, then no matter what terror or suffering we're going, occurs, we'll be able to face up to it. But we need to begin the preparations to have that that uh, be able to face up to them now. If it's if we don't do that, instead of tomorrow, you can die. Otherwise, when you get to the strip, when you have that suffering and terror, then you're going to have to. So we can't con conceive of it now when we, if we, we can, if we don't know how to think about it now when we're having a good time, then how are we going to be able to think about it in the future when we're about to die? So therefore, the, when the times when adversity occurs, 
are the best opportunity for us to improve our practice. It's the best time for us to practice the company. And so it's important for us not to let this uh, opportunity pass us by. Now, of course, it's good if we don't encounter any adversity, but, but I'm, I'm not saying you have to go look at and try to find some adversity. I think, I think uh, okay, the, there's such a benefit from adversity, I better go look for it. Now, there's no point in doing that. An adversity is not something you need to look at. It's going to come to you. We all experience adversity and suffering. It's going to happen naturally. And the day when it does come, you must make sure that you don't miss the opportunity. It's better if you don't experience adversity and suffering. But when the adversity and suffering do occur, then we don't need to immediately panic and get um, get depressed and lose all our courage. No, we can't get discouraged. No. Instead, we have to more have more courage. and be able to counsel ourselves and to not miss that opportunity. This is very important. Now, as I said before, the great beings, the difference between ourselves and great beings is, great beings, the biggest difference is, is not a question of whether they are suffering and, and problems. The uh, great beings they do sometimes need to have even greater adversity, and so because they're doing such great things, they're doing such vast activity. And the the more vast your activity, the more difficulties you're going to have. But the biggest difference is that the great beings, when they rise up from within the difficulty, they continue moving forward. When we have difficulties, we are unable to get up, and we're pressed down by all the difficulties. So that's the difficult. That's the difference. If we want to become great beings, we need to learn how to stand up and move forward. And in order to do that, we need to uh, study and study with the great beings. We look at the uh, life liberation stories of the great beings and study them. So next, there's uh, one more thing. So now the, this is the end of the teaching. And so next we have... So there's, a, there's a transmission I would like to give you. And this transmission is for in 2019. While I was in Europe. Like the, the, all the great, great beings have all these dreams with all these visions and signs, and they actually say, but I never have any like, these signs or omens. That never happens to me. But uh, a couple of years ago, when I was in Europe, one evening I had a dream where I met uh, Captain Tonga Rinpoche. And in my dream, uh, people are making an offer. I was, I was making a long life offering to Rinpoche and reciting a long life prayer. And the prayer that I was reciting in this is some sort of a, I don't remember, sort of written out. And when I uh, written out long life prayer, when I woke up, I remembered a good deal of the uh, long life prayer that I recited uh, in there. And so this is a great connections is something that doesn't normally happen. So it's really amazing. So, so I wrote it down. And so I uh, gave it to some other people. And so for that reason, I don't need to say too much about this. Kenshin Tongren is uh, a 
as one of the greatest lamas uh, who has done whatever he can for the teachings of medicine, in particular for the uh, uh, Kajim uh, the kindness is hard to come better than many of our great uh, lamas have passed away. There is uh, Kabjai Bokhara Mishin, he's passed away. He passed away at a young age. It was a great, a great loss. Uh, Tanker Rinpoche has passed away. And many of the other old lam, uh, lamas have passed away. Likewise, also our Kempatsutra Rinpoche, as uh, the situation is not in such good health, and these situations happen. Now, Kaja Tanker Rinpoche is still, is still able to perform his activities, still able to give teachings. This is such a good situation. I think we all need to rejoice in this. We should all uh, be excited about this. So now Rinpoche is, of course, very old, elderly, but a great being. It's like a great treasure. As long as their hair can uh, bring benefit to sentient beings and the teachings, and so there's, you know, the longer this, there's no limit to that length to how long we limit how they should length. So we should say that for as long as, uh, please stay as long as there are sentient beings, and so we always make this aspiration. I think it's very important for us to make these interests, and I make this prayer as every day. In general, for all sentient beings, and among them the the uh, the Dalai Lama, I write their long life prayers every day, and I also recite the the life the long life prayers for all the the the, the, the heart sons and so forth, and all the great uh, uh, beings of this karma constitution. And I recite these every day. It's because of the situation. If they can stay, then it'll be good for us. We'll have good times. And it will be. And this is something that'll be very good for us. And if they do not live, then we're going to experience suffering. And so for that reason, uh, I always recite the long life prayers. And so I thought, so I thought now they should particularly recite this uh, long life prayer for uh, Tranga Rinpoche. So I thought I'd uh, recite this uh, prayer. I'm not able to show it all. I mean, I don't have any to show you. So what can I do? Please wait a moment.
Okay, so here it is. I'm going to recite the, give you the transmission now. You can all hear me, right? Long life prayer from long distance. Tabangasu so that was the long life prayer. So next, um, there are the, I'd like to say a few words, and particularly to the different, uh, uh, a few words to say to the people from the Trangu centers around the world. And so that's enough for now. So that is, I will distribute that to the Trangu centers around the world later. Now, as we are doing the long life prayers, to read the words of the long life prayer for Kenshin Trangu and Bache. Between your hands, united in equipoise, you hold the vase of deathlessness that collects the nectar of the highest undefiled wisdom. Lord of life, Amitayus, grant auspiciousness. Far and wide, you sound the roar of the fearless view. Up to the peak of existent place, your turquoise mane of the Dharma of scripture and realization. You have perfected the physical strength of being learned, venerable, and accomplished. By inner speech, I ask you to live long. By the power of the victors of their foremost offspring, the gods and sages and siddhas, and by the strength of the truth of my pure intentions, may my prayer be accomplished without any obstacles. This prayer for the long life of Kyabjitanga Rinpoche, the incomparable be kind, spiritual master of the teachings in their entirety, came a few days ago in the confused appearances of sleep. I dreamt that I was making a long life offering to Kyabja Tonga and Bashan praying like this for his long life. When I woke up, I still remembered a few words, thinking that in this degenerate time, a source of refuge like him, living long, would be beneficial for the teachings and beings. I, his student and servant, Urjan Dorje, wrote this prayer.